Welcome to one of the final events of the academic year at the Center for European Studies. My name is Mary Lewis and I teach the history of France and its former empire here at Harvard. I want first of all to thank all the institutions and people who made this possible. Jegorsh Eckert, the director of CES for making this a director seminar. The Hutchins Center for co-sponsoring the support of the cultural services of the French Embassy of the United States, our able staff, especially Vasily Saris, Gila Nadari, and Michael Berrio for all the logistical and IT arrangements. Most of all, I would like to thank our two distinguished speakers and their staff for making this possible and taking time from their very busy schedules. It has been almost a year since the horrific news of George Floyd's murder an event that inspired horror, not only here in the United States as one of all too many instances of police brutality against non-whites in this country, but that also resonated across Europe where some of the largest demonstrations in the wake of the murder occurred. Now that we are nearly at the anniversary of those demonstrations, it seems appropriate to take stock. Of course, Europeans have been grappling with racism and the legacy of colonialism and discrimination for much longer than the headlines about those demonstrations last summer might lead one to believe. And we are grateful to have with us today two people who have dedicated their careers to the question of how best to uphold human rights and achieve equality in their respective countries. The format for today will be as follows. I will introduce our two speakers and ask a couple of questions to them, as well as a follow-up question or two to get the discussion going. Then we will turn to questions we receive in advance and questions you pose in the Q&A today. Given the very tight schedule of our two distinguished guests, it's unlikely that we will get to every question. If questions are similar, we may consolidate some of them in the interest of time. Now to introductions. Christiane Taubira was elected four times to the National Assembly of France representing French Guiana, where she was the driving force behind the 2001 law that recognizes the Atlantic slave trade and slavery as a crime against humanity. In 2012, she was appointed Justice Minister of France and in that capacity, she oversaw fundamental penal reforms that prevent recidivism and promote rehabilitation. And she introduced a law that both legalized same-sex marriage in France and allowed same-sex couples to adopt children. Her political engagement embodies an outstanding commitment and dedication to human rights, dignity, and equal rights for all. She is also the author of many books, including Code Noir de l'Esclavage aux Abolitions in 2006, Égalité pour les exclus, le politique face à l'histoire et à la mémoire coloniale in 2009, Mumu à la jeunesse in 2016, and Nous habitons la terre in 2017. Aminata Touré is a member of the Schleswig-Holstein Parliament in Germany. She was sworn in on June 29, 2017, becoming the first Black and the youngest female member of the Schleswig-Holstein Parliament. She is also a spokeswoman for the Green Party for Refugees and Equality of Women and Men. She was born in 1992 in Germany as the child of two refugees from Mali. Prior to coming to Parliament, she worked in the German Bundestag for two years. And she has a bachelor's degree in political science and French philology. So we are going to start with a question for Madame Taubira. So we're two weeks shy of the 20 year anniversary, seems incredible, of the law recognizing that the slave trade and um, slavery was a crime against humanity, which is known, of course, as the Tobira law, after you. Um, this was passed on the 21st of May, 2001. And in a speech supporting that law, um, you argued that the law would constitute a sort of symbolic reparation. In using those words, it seems to me that you suggested that the way we understand the past matters for how we live together in the present in a pluralistic society that was, after all, partly formed by that crime. Can you say more about the connection between living together, vivant ensemble of contemporary society and the need to address the history of racism and the crimes that it abetted? And 20 years later, would you say that the crime has been repaired 
Or is this a perpetual reparation that can never cease? Are there other past wrongs that you believe France or Europe more, more generally should repair? I realize that was more than one question, but uh, <laughs> let you choose. That is. That is. <laughs> Madame the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lewis. Uh, it's really a very important question. Uh, first, first of all, uh, I'd, like, um, I'd like to tell you how pleased I am sharing this discussion, this event with you, Professor Lewis, with uh, Vice President uh, Aminata Toure. It's really my pleasure to share this floor with you. And um, I, I feel like uh, participating at a kind of three generation event, you know, <laughs> kind of meeting of three generations. Um, I, I'd just like to, to, to warn that uh, English is not my daily language. I live in a Creole and French environment. Um, I, 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 don't worry, I don't worry for mistakes, but I care for misunderstanding. Uh, so please uh, don't hesitate to let me know if and when it happens that what I'm saying is not clear enough, right? So I, I, I try to, to answer your three questions, at least, <laughs> at least three. Uh, first, about uh, symbolic reparation. Uh, 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 what I meant at this time and what I still mean is that uh, no one on earth, no one, uh, not a single government, uh, not a company, no matter how rich or how powerful they can be, no one can refund the millions of lost lives and moreover of every single life. It's just impossible to reach it. So let, let's make it clear, the crime itself is not reparable, clearly. Does that mean that uh, it's just, uh, okay, uh, we are sorry and that's all? <laughs> not at all, not at all. Sorry is not enough. Even if sorry is the beginning of all, even if sorry is the least of all, but uh, repairing is not at the reach of every, anyone. Mm -hmm. However, however, it's not enough. Sorry is not enough. That's why this law, the French law, uh, uh, known as Taubira law, this French law recognizing slavery and um, trade slave and slavery as a crime against humanity uh, contains other consistent sections such as teaching this history at all levels from primary school until university, celebrating officially, and there's a French president authority every year. It's uh, on May uh, 10th, it will be next Monday. And uh, there is a national committee, this law created also a national committee dealing with history, memory, um, spurring international relationship, promoting action, and now a French national uh, foundation on slavery and memory. And judicial, the law contains to judicial measures against people de denying this crime as such. So uh, it's very important to take care, to, to, to take a to take account of all this, very important because it's not just uh, we know, yes, it was a crime against humanity. And it's very important to say that what this law means first, and this is a part, the core of uh, symbolic reparation. The, this law says on behalf of the French Republic that the European monarchies, uh, which uh, practices committed this crime, were committed a crime, even if, even though enslavement trade were declared uh, legal. They were legal at this time, but anyway, it was a crime. And it's very important for children and for students and for uh, young people, it's very important for them to understand that sometimes a law, even if it's, it passed regularly, a law may be immoral, a law may be undue, a law may be, may be 
illegitimate. And these laws at this time were at this time, not today, because a lot of people say, well, yes, you, you talk about uh, our present moral. No, at this time, this law was already illegitimate. And at this time, enslaved people were already fighting again enslavement, enslavement. And at this time, people in, uh, in the colonies, but people in the uh, metropolis in, in Europe were already saying, we don't agree with that. That's not fair. You don't have the right to treat human beings like that. At this time, they were saying that. So we must understand that this law, even if it was an official law, was an illegitimate law. Uh, maybe I can say a few words about living together. Living together is very important because we all live in, uh, uh, in pluralistic societies. And pluralistic societies that doesn't come from the sky. It's the result, the consequences of the, the, the triangular trade. Uh, pluralistic society comes from the fact of deporting millions of people during centuries. It's the fallout of occupying other people countries. It's a fallout of uh, receiving colonial troops of fighters during the, the uh, World War I and II. That's the consequences of that. So, so it's the consequences of our common history. And we know now that race does not exist. Racism, yes, but race, no. So we have to fight in each of our society in order to organize laws to, to make pass to, to, to make pass laws that recognize equality for all and to enforce these laws as realities. Thank you. Well, I could not agree more with <laughs> what you just said, um, especially the part about how pluralistic society <clears throat> is a result of this crime um, and other crimes. Um, that have been committed in, um, in the past. So um, I think we will come back to some of the um, important points that you raised um, about the consequences of conquest and about especially about the difference between race and racism. But before we do, I wanted to bring Frau Torre into this conversation um, because um, you know, in the last year or so, German legislators have proposed the elimination of the word race from Article 3 of the German Constitution. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Article 3 is the Equal Protection Clause, which prohibits discrimination by race and other social categories. So um, it's interesting to think about like what it means to actually take that word out of an Equal Protection Clause. Do you agree with this? Do you feel it's important to eliminate this word race and if so, how do you reconcile this with demands to acknowledge racist violence and discrimination um, for what they are? Frau Torre. Thank you, first of all, for having me. I'm very excited and very happy to be part of this discussion. And I'm very happy also to meet Christian uh, Tobira. First of all, greetings from my mom. She's a major fan of yours uh, and she's uh, also watching right now. Thank you. <laughs> so um, to your question. Um, First of all, I was one of those legislators who were asking for changing this word race. What you have to know, first of all, is that the meaning of the word race in German is another meaning than in English, for example. First of all, this is important to know because sometimes it sounds weird that we're asking for changing this word. We want another word to be used in our constitution. We do not want to eliminate the fact that racism and racist violence exists in Germany. We want to use another word. I do believe that it is important to eliminate the word race in our constitution because in Germany it has another connotation and that is the major part. Um, the term race is outdated in Germany and it is racist itself. And my colleague and my, the party leader of the party where I'm a member in, the Greens, Robert Habeck and I, we wrote a paper with a lot of demands. 
And one of it was to erase the word from our constitution. We're not saying that the founding fathers and mothers of our constitution in 1949 had bad intentions when they wrote the constitution following what previously happened in the sense of killings and enslavement in Germany. So, however, they used racist language and that sought to kill people. And this is the major problem. Our constitution, this is the position I have, is a social contract and that needs to be adjusted as social debates are developing. But what I believe most in actually is that we need to have a grown up conversation in Germany about racism, because this is what really misses. And um, this is what we had in Germany when we are talking about the term race in our constitution, we had a debate going on in Germany about why do we use this word? Why is it a problem? Why do we need another word for it? And this is a conversation we do not have in Germany because first of all, everyone will ask you, does racism exist in Germany? Do we have a problem with it? Is it something which happened in the past, but not in the present? And this has a lot of lot to do with the fact that we are not very good educated in the colonial system we were a part of in Germany. In Germany, most of the time we grow up thinking that we didn't participate. France was bad, Great Britain was bad, but Germany just participated in the end. And that is, that is actually not true. And this word race is connected to this history or to this story we tell to ourselves that we haven't been participating. Although there has been an ideology which was based on language, for example, that there are different races, human races, which is the reason why it is okay to kill black people, why it is okay to enslave black people and others. So this is the discussion and conversation we need to have. And we did not have it enough in Germany, I would say. And this is why I'm happy that we're having this conversation right now, because that at that point, we understand how racism um, began and what we should do about it. And uh, I think this conversation is the most important. Thank you. I see some convergence here in the perspective. Um, and so I wanted to kind of push this question a little bit further, uh, the, the issue of race versus racism. Um, you know, the American historian um, Barbara Fields has called race like geocentrism. It's not real but it has real effects and people believe in it, right? Or believed in it uh, as they did in geocentrism. But she also says that, you know, um, uh, racism is real, that it's not a superstition, it's not a hoax. It has real um, consequences, sometimes murderous uh, consequences. So that's on the one hand that this is a social construction, but that it has, you know, it, the racism itself has real effect. On the other hand, you know, I look at these debates right now, Madame Taubira is probably familiar with this about the Napoleon ex exhibition in Paris that's going to open. And there's a whole set of arguments about whether Napoleon, um, you know, uh, uh, whether, whether, sorry, in re reinstituting the slave trade as uh, the slavery, sorry, um, was, you know, uh, in, in, engaging in a racist act. And just recently on France en Terre, Arthur Chevalier said, oh, you know, slavery is not about race. And, you know, the Athenians had slavery. Um, and, you know, I wonder if removing the word race also can have implications in that people may believe that that no one ever believed in that geocentrism. You know what I mean? Uh, that, that perhaps, um, we fool ourselves into thinking that if we remove race from, um, from discourse, uh, that perhaps we remove racism. And I know that you know that that's not true, but I wonder if you could talk about the kind of balancing act that, that's involved in that. Um, perhaps um, Frau Torre is shaking his seems ready to answer so <laughs> please yeah I'm ready to answer um yeah first of all what is important to know is that we don't want to remove the word and not replace it what we want is to replace the word in germany because we think there is probably another a better word for it because 
a lot of people in Germany do not know about the history of, of this word, for example, and they argue with the fact that there are human races in Germany, for example, or in the world, because it is written down in our constitution. So what we want is that we still talk about racism and write it down in our constitution so that we find another and a better word than race, because again, it is something else in Germany to talk about race than to talk about race in, 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 in the United States or in France or in other countries because the meaning and the connotation of this word is another. And I think it is always important to put it into context um, of, uh, of the history of a country, of the language of a country. This is the most important thing. So what we're talking about is to substitute the word, find a better one and to um, to emphasize and to 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 strengthen the 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 the, the importance and the 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 thing the state has to do our um, country has to do is to protect people from racism this is what we want to do by um, changing the word in our constitution and madame Tobira, do you have thoughts on this Yes, I agree with all uh, Frau Tore uh, Aminata said, uh, you are like my daughter, you know? So, <laughs> Mrs. V Vice President, I call you Aminata, if you will allow me. Uh, I, I agree with all. Uh, I, I do believe that there is inherently an ambivalence in uh, the fact that uh, the, the word race is inside our official documents. We had this debate in France too. Uh, we did not end up yet because it passed in the National Assembly and not yet in the Senate, but we had, uh, we, we, we drove this fight too. Because I do believe that there is this ambivalence because when you have this word in the constitution, uh, you, you, it's a kind of, uh, no, we don't want you to discriminate anyone. And at the same time, yes, we know that you believe that humanity may be divided between uh, uh, superior, uh, superior people and inferior people. And uh, we tell you not, but we tell you no, but somehow we make room for this here. In this official document, we make room for here, for it because it's written here, even it's for uh, to to say we don't want you we don't want you to do so okay so it's really an ambivalence because race is an id it's not a fact unfortunately as an id it generates a reality in the mind of a lot of people and it generates a hard life uh, in the today life of a lot of other people so we have to take care of that and uh, what I do believe is that uh, in spite of this ambivalence, we must not agree with the fact that race is inside the official documents. That's quite clear for me. We must not accept that. But we have to fight against the effect and we have to, to, to do so with the laws, but also with Politic, public policies, poli public policies and financial means um, allocated to these public policies in order to enforce the law and uh, in order to allow citizens to be able to fight against discrimination, racism, and this kind of things. Uh, you know, in this kind of infernal cycle between race, racism, and the crime, we must know, we must say that the crime was first. The crime was first. Race and racism were invented in order to justify the crime, but the crime was first. And so and so racism generates new crimes until today, but the crime was first. So we have to fight with the law, but we have to fight with public policies. When I was a keeper of seals, uh, Minister of Justice in France, I passed a law, a kind of French pattern of class action, allowing citizens to mutualize their judicial procedures 
uh, because what is very important that we must understand that one person who is victim of discrimination or racism, this person is vulnerable at the present time of the discrimination of the racism, this person is or feel very vulnerable. And it's very, very important to, to give this person and all the citizens uh, the opportunity to gather in order to, to sue together. And uh, I understand your, 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 your concern, Professor Lewis. If we, we, we pull out, uh, we, we, <laughs> we uh, express uh, uh, the word from the constitution, how can we uh, fight? Two levels. What I said already, we already have some laws. I mean, national laws, European laws, and um, even multilateral. I think about UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, and all protocols and conventions. So we have some laws, even if we have to, 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 to keep on uh, um, improving improving the laws and uh, we 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 have to 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 drive this public to conceive and to drive these these public policies with some financial means and um, we have to think about it according to what you you are making as observations we have to think about it we don't want the word race but we want to fight against racism. I think that there is a philosophical, uh, a philosophical level too. And uh, uh, someone like uh, Edouard Lisson can inspire us with what he calls a uh, vision prophetic du passé. We can approximately uh, uh, translate by uh, prophetic vision of the past. It sounds like a paradox, but it, uh, it's, it clarifies, as well as the book of Barbara Fields and Karen Fields, it clarifies uh, race is an idea, uh, but racism is a fact and a crime. And uh, with this uh, prophetic vision of the past, uh, what Edouard Glissant explained to us, that is, uh, in spite of archives, archives, we have access of archives more and more, in spite of that, there is things we were never able to understand and to feel deeply. That's why we have to, to, to make room for imaginary. I don't say imagination. It doesn't say imagination. It says imaginary. That means how can we manage in order to try to understand how the enslaved people themselves uh, were trying to survive, trying to think, uh, trying to fight to protect themselves, to protect their, their, their loved ones, children, husband, wives, in spite of the, the, the despair, in spite of the violence, in, in spite of their own fear, uh, in spite of this chaos, how did they manage to survive and to think and to think and to, and to live and to fight and to, and to hope how did they survive? And we need imaginary to be able to perceive just a little bit how it was at this time. And in honor of all these people who fighted, who suffered, who were mistreated, who were sold, we, who resisted, who revolted, we have to find a way to find a path in order to Get out, to, to risk, get out. We don't recognize you, get away. And at the same time, to be more and more performant in the fight again against racism. That's so interesting. Um, there are already many, many questions in the Q&A and as well as some that were asked ahead of time. And um, if you're looking at it, you'll notice that the two panelists, you'll notice that there are quite a few questions from David Screen and a number of others for Frau Torre to be a little bit more specific about what the connotations, the specific connotations of the word race in German are 
Mm -hmm. And what, in another question, um, what word or words would you use to replace it? And yes. I suppose that might be a question um, for um, Madame Taubira also, you know, how do you combat racism without the protected category? Um, yeah. You know, so I'll, I'll throw that out there. Yeah, this is, this is actually the discourse we're having right now in Germany. We're asking ourselves um, which word could replace the word race better than race, for example, racial discrimination or something like this. This is the debate which is going on right now and we're really honestly having this discussion. Um, and to the question why it has another connotation, I'd say that um, in the English discourse, for example, when we read about race theories and everything like this, it always has an, a connotation which is not only biology, it's also a social connotation we have in, in, the, in the English language, for example. In the German language, it's only biology. It's only trying to, you know, um, put people into different, um, um, I'm missing the word, but um, to categorize people, um, although we know there is only one human race, for example. Um, and you also have to know that, for example, in Germany, 1935, uh, um, um, we had the situation with the Nürnberger Rassengesetze, um, which was the law to discriminate legally um, people, Jewish people, minorities, and so on, which led to the um, fact that a lot of people had been in concentration camps, had been killed, and so on, and so on. So the connotation in Germany, if you hear the word, is another connotation than we um, have when we hear the word in English, for example. We have Black people, for example, who use the word race, in German and do not use the word Rasse, which is in German the same actually, but has different connotation. And I know it's hard to understand if you're not in Germany, for example, or if you use the word in English, but it has another connotation. What we don't want is that this cat category is gone. We need the category to make sure and clear we have a problem with racism and we want to combat um, racism, but we need another word. And another point I'd like to point out as well is that what I observe is that most of the time, and I deeply believe that language is important. I know that language is important. The words we use is important, are important. But it is also important to understand that when I said that we wrote this paper with a lot of demands, everyone was just talking about the fact that we were talking about um, substituting the word race. Although it is about much more if we talk about racism, we do not only want to speak about this word, but we really need legislators, the governments to act against racism. But in Germany, most of the time we have a situation where, where we take the easiest point. We say, okay, this sounds easy. Changing the constitution should be easy. We should do that. But what we want, what we really want is that we talk about institutional racism, for example. Let's talk about laws which are racist. Let's talk about the fact that we also have police officers which are racist. Let's talk about um, so many things which are racist in our country and what we should do about it in politics. And what we observe while we have this discussion about race and trying to find another word is that everyone was talking about this because it's easier to talk about this word than to talk about the actual racism which is happening and taking place every day. That a lot of people are talking about the fact that they um, they, they, they had to go through racism in, in, the, in, in their school system um, while they're working, when they try to find, find a housing for themselves. All these facts are more and most importantly. For me, we can leave the word in the constitution if we're tackling all the other things, if you ask me. This is what I would say, but I think it is something we have to think together. But most of the people and especially politicians think it's the easiest way to find another word. And then we have done everything against racism. And I think this is the wrongest way you could go. I think it's one of the things we should do, but not the only thing we should do. Before we turn to Madame Taubira, there's a follow-up question from a Harvard student, Maria Guramar, um, who asks whether Madame Taubira could speak to the proposal to use the words prétendu race uh, to replace race, which would be translated maybe as alleged race, 
um, to convey the fact that you we still need to fight a concept um, while at the same time um, recognizing that it doesn't have a biological basis. It's really, thank you for this question, but it's really a, a collective matter. And uh, personally, I, I should not agree with that because the, the words should still be there. And uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's really an ambivalence. We, we, we must agree that it's ambivalent and it's not simple. I agree with that, I, 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 I reject it. So I, I, I should not agree with alleged race because the, the, the word should be there again. And um, uh, th there are other words. There are other words, origin, ap appearance, uh, and it's possible to find other words and, and not to agree with the existence, uh, the supposed, the alleged existence of uh, a different category of, of people because when you, you, you agree with different category of people, you agree with superiority until the philosophy which holds one way superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned. You know that everywhere is war. Uh, uh, within a few days, it will be, we, we will remember the death, the 14th, 40th anniversary of the death of Bob Marley. Hmm? War in the East, war in the West, war up North, war, war up South. We don't need no more trouble. We don't need no trouble. So if we agree with race, whatever, with uh, uh, alleged before or something else behind, we, we keep, we, we're still in trouble. We're still in trouble. We don't need no more trouble. We have to, to, be, to be sure that we, we organize equality for all. Democracies, democracies, principles and value pretend equality for all. So until the philosophy of one race superior and another inferior is permanently discredited and abandoned. Thank you, Bob Marley. But that's right, that's right. So we have to fight, I think, no concession, no to race, no to race. And uh, yes, we have to fight against racism and that's possible with uh, public policies. That's quite possible. Sorry, I, I know I, I, I think very false, but uh, excuse me for your ears, but uh, I do love this, uh, this song. That was wonderful, thank you. Um, we have a question from Juliana Tamides, um, who thanks you both for your inspiring leadership and important work, and are wondering how social movements in Germany and France have helped change the political conversation around racism and imperialism, maybe starting as far back as the 1970s and 80s, maybe uh, talking about which groups have been the most influential. And that also leads me to a pre-posed question from a former Harvard student, Pablo Rasmussen, who asked ahead of time um, what, whether you think young people have a role to play and if they've played a particular role in changing the conversation. So if you could address either or both of those questions, that would be wonderful. Yeah, um, I could answer to the question um, how social movements in the 1970s or 80s um, were important for the way of talking about racism, for example. Um, we had in Germany in the 1980s um, a black feminist movement, which was very important. It was led by Maya Yim and Audre Lorde, who came to Germany and helped moving or forming the Afro-German movement in Germany. And um, I think it was very important uh, for the way of talking about racism in Germany, for example. And a lot of people who are fighting against racism today, especially in the Black community, are inspired by this Black feminist movement, Black feminist lesbian movement, uh, I have to um, admit at this point. Um, so it is important until today and this is what we're looking to because the movement of for, for especially black people fighting against uh, racism and um, is not that old it's like it really began in the 1980s the two biggest black organizations in germany were found in the 1980s 
um, the, the, the Afro-German woman group and um, the initiative for black people in Germany were found in the 1980s. So today when we're talking about all this or the last year or the past year, while where we had also big protests going on in Germany, according to the killing of George Floyd, um, all those people who are fighting against racism for decades had been there. Um, so we found words like Afro-German. We found a way to, 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 to name ourselves with not racist terms, for example, because it has always been racist words they found for Black people in Germany. So they were important in this movement. Um, so this is probably to the first question. The second question was, um, the second question was young people and participating in change. Was that the question? I forgot. Yeah, okay. So what actually I'm doing the whole time um, in my work next to all these things I have to um, work on is to, to, to try to, to, to inspire and to empower people, young people especially, to go into politics, to care about politics, because I think it is important because a lot of things we're facing right now, climate change, racist societies, and so on. Um, we need young people for those movements. And what I observed is, especially in the last year, when we were talking a lot about, for example, how to combat um, um, racism or how to fight racism, there have been especially a lot of young people, young diverse people, black, white, queer, non-queer, and, and so on, who were fighting um, all together. And so I think young people are very, very, very important in the question of social movements. Um, I think history taught us that it has always been like that. Thank you so much. Does Madame Taubira have um, any further reflections on that? Yes, a few words. Uh, personally, I'm very, very confident on young people. Very, very. Uh, uh, that's a way I, 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 I uh, I maintain my, my own optimism because I watch to young people and I, I see that more and more the, these people know the world how it is. And uh, they know that uh, the earth is round and uh, uh, that all of us and each of us is accountable of the world, of the planet. You know, so uh, they, 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 they watch the world, they see that, that uh, uh, some people travel with a passport, some other people travel with a bundle, there is a great inequalities in the world, great injustices, uh, but people are moving, people are fighting, and uh, these different people don't agree with the world as it is. So now more and more you have young people uh, in the, uh, the past, you could find uh, parents saying to their people, uh, just, just uh, be calm, just be quiet. That's the way things are. Today, no more, no more. And uh, uh, young people no longer stand with, uh, no longer agree uh, not to have the job they, de they deserve, uh, not to have uh, the, the the shelter uh, they have the right to have, uh, not not to not to have the right to be who they are, who they are. They, they are uh, uh, several persons inside one person because they have uh, diverse heritages. You know, it, it, there are not a lot, a lot of people who have only a single heritage. A lot of people, young people today, the world is like that. That the world, that the way the world is, is a result of history. So more and more, let's say quickly that there are young people who are racist, fascist, and, and who don't stand uh, uh, other people. They exist, and sometimes they are very dynamic, uh, and uh, they can they can become criminal. We know that. We know that. Uh, sometimes they claim for their crimes. We know that. But massively, tendentially, young people are aware of the state of the world. They watch the world, they communicate uh, across the countries, 
they, they think together and they can find a lot of young, uh, a lot of uh, old people, all men, all ladies like me, uh, we still uh, believe in ideal. Uh, we still believe strongly that people are equal, that uh, we, we have a, a kind of natural and ethical solidarity uh, to drive uh, on, on the earth and uh, who are ready to, to give all their strong, all their strengths in, in this uh, fight. Uh, there are uh, old people able to do so, but as a generation, young people is quite able. They have to be creative, more inventive, but they are quite able because they know the world. They are informed, they are educated, they, they think by themselves, they know the world, and they, they are quite able to change it, to improve it. That is uh, really heartening to hear because, as you mentioned, there is a sort of neo-fascist, you know, tendency emerging um, here and in Europe. Um, and uh, so, you know, there had been a number of questions about the extreme right in the Q and A, as well as in some of our pre-circulated um, questions, uh, and also there are questions about. Um, the extent you, you alluded to this sort of cross-border solidarities, um, Madame Tobira, just now. So one of the questions that we received in advance from, um, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Shayan Mataluko from the Harvard Law School, uh, was whether uh, there ought to be more pan-European unity amongst um, Black people or um, non-white people in Europe to ensure change. Um, so that's one question. And then another question related to uh, your earlier point about political extremism is, you know, um, what one can do given this tendency, given the, you know, popularity of some of the far-right movements in Europe at the moment uh, to combat, uh, let's say, um, Islamophobia, which is a form of racism. Uh, and so those are sort of, I'm, I'm putting two questions together because we're getting low on time and I know they're not totally connected, but if you could pick either or both of those questions um, and we'll see where that gets us in terms of time. Thank you. Yes, um, to the question to Pan-Africanism, for example, or connecting Black people all over the world. Um, the first time I was in the United States was 2019. And I was part of a Black European delegation. We've been um, in the United States and Washington, D.C. because of the Congressional Black Caucus Week. So what I'm trying to say with that is there is a connection between Black people all over the world. I met people from every every continent there. So we also have a connection uh, on the European base. We are connecting, we are talking about the different legislations which are happening in the different countries. For example, um, in Austria, um, I have a black colleague who's also part of the national parliament who asked me before she had her negotiations concerning um, coalition papers, um, how they're going to combat um, racism, for example. We're talking, we're talking, we're trying to, to exchange experience um, on different levels, on political level, on civil levels on every level. So this is happening um, and um, um, I'm very happy and glad about it because it also inspires me to see what we can do in Germany, for example, because I know that in Germany, for example, only to watch what's happening in Germany would have been hard to implement, for example, the um, action plan against racism in the state where I'm living and doing politics, for example. All these ideas came from different politicians all over the world, um, especially black politicians. And the other point is um, the right wing movement in Europe. I'd like to point out Germany because the moment when I decided to, to, to go into politics was when I saw in Germany that a lot of right wing parties entered the parliaments on the different levels. 
And I was scared about it. I was deeply concerned about it because we thought in Germany, okay, these things are happening um, in Italy, in Spain, in France, in different other countries, in Great Britain, but we in Germany, we are fine. And I think it has something to do with the fact that we always think, or we always thought, or those in responsibility, especially on the in, in, in the government on the national level, they thought we don't have a problem with racism, with right wings, with extremists. They acknowledged it last year. They acknowledged it that they ignored the problem of right wing parties, of racism, of extremism, because they thought that this is not something which has something to do with the present. And I think this is part of reality, actually. They always said that we're exaggerating a little bit as minorities pointing out racism, right wings, or we have been experienced um, the time we lived in Germany, for example. And this is why I said at the beginning, we need to have a grown up conversation because if we do not talk about this fact, if we do not educate ourselves about it, then we will not be able to fight it because you always have to think about the fact that it needs a long time so that right-wing parties really are implemented, that they build themselves and they are part of a government. They are the biggest opposition party in the national parliament in Germany. You have to imagine, and everyone, and especially politicians, I'd say, are not, didn't, didn't see this. They didn't see this coming because they thought this is not a problem we have to tackle, for example. So I think this is something we have to do. This was the reason why I myself um, went into politics in 2017, because I thought I have to do something about it right now. Yes, indeed. Um, and Madame Taubira, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yes. Uh, first, um, about um, um, connecting so-called black people, so-called black people, because uh, these people all around the world may have all kinds of colors, including beige. So <laughs> what is very important is uh, what are we aware of? Um, we have um let's say a, a collective heritage that is very specific it's specific not as black people uh so forth but it's collective as human beings and we have to share this specific experience this specific heritage because it's it comes from a, a, a history of oppression of domination of exclusion of being treated of having been treated as a, 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 a wood a, a good um, merchandise you know i've been sold i've been denied as human beings it's very singular experience, very singular experience. Because uh, often they say, yes, but uh, transatlantic uh, slave trade was uh, one among so many slaveries. No, this one is really particular. That doesn't mean the other slave uh, slaveries were fine or, or, or are acceptable. They are all, uh, we have to refuse all of them, all of them. No one can uh, own someone else, no one. But this one was organized and we know that racism came from this crime because they had to justify how they were organizing such a big crime against this kind of people, specifically against this kind of people. So, but it's really a singular experience. And if we are aware of this experience, a singular experience, we have to share it with the whole humanity. So, that seems to me very important. So it, it, we, we, don't, we, we could organize, uh, we put ourselves together all around the world. I guess probably we are a, a, a majority of humanity, if we look, really. Closely, if we look closely, probably we are the majority of humanity. We could say, but no, that's not what uh, this very, very uh, difficult, hard experience taught, 
to her, we learned something else. We learned vulnerability. We learned uh, solidarity. We learned joy. Uh, we learned how to take care of other people. That's what we learned, and that, that's what we have to share with world humanity because we belong to this humanity. We, we, are, we are part of this humanity. Concerning Muslim people, in Europe, that's quite right, there is a specific discrimination against Muslim people. Terrorism. Um, uh, but what we have to say, is a lot, uh, some people deliberately use this issue in order to discriminate this kind of citizen. They use it because terrorism is a security issue. Because these people kill people blindly. There's no fair confrontation. So terrorism, whatever uh, 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 its inspiration, um, Islamist inspiration, as those killers call themselves Islamist, or a, a, a white supremacy that kills too. Whatever the inspiration, terrorism is terrorism. It's a criminal activity. It's not a social one. So Muslim citizens are citizens. And they don't have to apologize for crimes they did not commit. And they must not be discriminated on behalf of a kind of essentialist solidarity. So terrorism is terrorism. It's a security matter. It's a security issue. It's a political one, as long as living together and ensuring everyone's safety is a core of the so-called contrat social, the social contract. In that way, it's a political one. But otherwise, it's a security issue. And Muslim citizens does, don't have to answer of terrorism, even if terrorism pretends. Yet, yet we, are, we, we have to wonder why this confusion between uh, Islam and Islamism, between a terrorist, uh, Islamist terrorist, and a, 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 a Muslim citizen is so, so easy to expand. Uh, it's so easy to, 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 to be used in order to devise uh, the people. Uh, I presume that it's probably because everything related to religion is so passionate, so emotional, so sensitive, so little rational, that uh, we, we really have to work with that. We have to work as with uh, the, the word race, we have to unwork the word race. We have to unwork all these uh, uh, religious items that uh, facilitate confusion and, uh, and divide, divide the society and fragilize certain kind of citizens. Absolutely, I could not agree more. Um, so we're basically out of time. I have one more question, which is the last question in the Q&A, but was also posed several times uh, in advance by people. Um, and that is a question for Madame Taubira, whether you think that taking part in one way or another in the French presidential election next year would help tackle the far right parties and unify the French left. Um. Uh, that question is always a trap, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if if uh, it comes from France or from somewhere else. Uh, what I can say is that uh, I respect a lot people who uh, who, who care for um, the presidential running uh, next year because uh, the situation is very very. Um, um, quiet less, 
quiet less. I'm very quiet less, and a lot of people are very quiet less of the situation. I do believe that in France and in Europe and in other parts of the world, uh, um, the situation is very, very degraded and degrading. Um, and we have to, 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 to put our strengths together. I'd like to take my part. I don't know how it will be possible for me uh, to take part of the fight, uh, but uh, uh, I, I hope it will be possible to do so. Uh, the, the, the different uh, left families in France, in France are in bad, bad state. And uh, that's really a pity because uh, the hour is very important uh, for, for, for vulnerable people, for poor people, uh, for young people. It's very a bad time. The present time is, very, is really a bad time. So I hope it will be possible to make something useful. I don't know how, I don't yet know how, and I am quite honest when I say so. I'm, I'm unquiet, I'm really unquiet. Uh, I, I feel some anguish because I care for the future, for, for how young people are going to live in our country with so many injustices, with so many inequalities, see, with so many crimes, with uh, so few prospects. I'm, I'm unquiet of that, but uh, I, I, till now, up to now, I, I, I don't yet see how I, I, I shall be uh, able to be part of it. Well, thank you very much for that honest and frank answer. And thank you to both of you and um, Frau Torre as well. If you have any last thoughts, um, please share them. And wanna thank the audience for an engaged discussion as well. Um, and I wish you both um, all the uh, luck and um, fortitude in your continued fight for these causes as you have done in the past. Thank you, Eva. it was really a pleasure. And uh, Mrs. Vice President, please say hello to your mom from me. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, I'm always happy to have this transatlantic conversation because I think it is important that we discuss those things because what I realized most when I was first time in the United States is that it is important to know vice versa how the situation are in our countries and I hope that you could learn a little bit about the situation in Europe and um, that um, we continue talking and continue having this grown-up conversation. Absolutely we need to have as many grown-ups in the room as possible in these uh, trying times. Thank you both so much.